Hello, my name is Peter Schilling, and we're excited to have with us today pop artist Howie Green, who is well known locally and recognized internationally for a variety of artwork, including his book Jazz Fish Zen Adventures in Mambo Land, pop art toys, cows, furniture, murals, many public and community art projects, including works for the Boston Celtics and the Boston Red Sox Foundation and also his paintings of more than 300 record album covers spanning more than 40 years of music. Howie, I get the sense that you will put paint and brush to any object. Pretty much anything, yeah. If it ain't moving, I'll paint it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've seen actually your utility boxes in around uh, the Boston metro area. There's one in my neighborhood. Uh, perhaps some of our viewers have seen your utility boxes. And how did that begin? Um, that began with a program that Mayor Menino started in Boston, and I was asked to submit some designs or some layouts for them, and I ended up doing, I think I've done nine of them. Nine? Yep. I've done here, I've done them in a couple other cities as well, but I've done nine of them in Boston. It seems I've seen many more uh, utility boxes painted than nine. How, how can that be? Well, there's a, there were a, a lot of artists got into the program and did it. There were, I think, the, the 15 or 20 or, or even more artists that yeah. were asked to paint the boxes. So yeah. there, there are, somebody told me there were over 10,000 utility boxes in Boston. <laughs> and the kind of things that you don't even notice until you start looking for them, then you realize they're everywhere. Yes, they are. And uh, Mayor Menino wanted to uh, give the Boston artist a platform to play with and have some fun with. And uh, so I, was, I couldn't wait. And uh, it started uh, about six years ago on one particular uh, weekend in, in April. And uh, like 25 of them were done in one weekend. <laughs> and then they kept going, they kept going, and then they kept asking me to do more of them and more of them. And I love painting them. It's fun to paint in public. Uh, well, how did you get interested at, at the, in the beginning? How did you get interested in art as a child? Um, well, I was about 12, 11 or 12, and I was, um, we were over at a, a family friend's house for Christmas Day for some reason, and we weren't expected. There was a power outage, and so they had they gave they had a bunch of presents, kind of generic presents that you would have for a kid in case somebody shows up. So I got given a uh, pad of multicolored newsprint and some drawing pencils, and I just started drawing, and like a light bulb went on. It's like, and that was it. And I've been drawing ever since. Were I, your parents artists? No, you nobody in my family is an artist. Family? There no? is not a creative person in my family previous to, you know, to my generation, and uh, I don't know where it came from. It's just, that was it. That day, the light bulb went on. And, and when did you start painting? When was painting your medium? Um, painting in art school, when I was in art school. Um, and what did you paint? Well, kind of the typical kind of stuff. I mean, I was sort of classically trained, you know, to paint realistically. So it was, you know, figures and landscapes and typical kind of stuff that people paint in art school. Uh, learning the sort of the, the ins and outs and the crafts of handling a paint and you know shadow and light and color and all that sort of stuff. It was great training. Um, I just said, well, other people have done this. What am I interested in? And well, after art school, after you graduated from art school, how were you able to become an established artist? I know many art school graduates who are struggling to make a living as an artist. How did you do it? Well, I came to Boston and fell flat on my face. I came here for a job, um, and the job fell through. So I ended up working at McDonald's. <laughs> uh, I've always been an opportunist, so when an opportunity presents itself, I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. So the owner of the McDonald's, this is in Newton, um, his wife worked at a large financial company, and they were big fans of the arts. And they had me do a little mural in their, in their bathroom, in their house. And then when she found out that the art department, which was down the hall from her, was looking for a, a junior des designer to start. She asked me if I'd be interested, and I was like, yes. <laughs> so I was working at McDonald's, and then I got the job interview through somebody at McDonald's, that, and uh, got the job, and that was it, and I started, that was the beginning. Was that what you would call your first big break, or was there some other event that you would call uh, an event that really helped you break through as an artist? Um, I think it was, Actually, previous to that was sort of the, the when I was still in school, I was in the cafeteria and I overheard a conversation that we're looking for a summer uh, job opening, and 
I kind of backed my chair up and was like, yeah, what's the job? And the job was working for the school in the uh, exhibit and communication department that the school had set up for students to run. And there was going to be nobody around for the summer. I was around, so I took the job mm -hmm. and uh, had it for for three years, the three and a half years, and I had an incredible facility there with every tool you could want as an artist. Great. And anyway, got, we got to make exhibits and make displays and do silk screening and do all kinds of reproduction. So all of my friends came down and hung out there all the time. So <laughs> it was a great student uh, art studio. And that really kind of began my interest in not just uh, painting, but also graphic design and illustration and other parts of this. Uh, this career, and I got to do all of it while I was still in school on a professional level. Well, that is fantastic. Very so, then, so that was sort of the real launching. Yeah. Real launching now, you're known as a pop artist. Correct. Um, <clears throat> and pop art, as we think of it today, we think of it as a, as a form of art that really emerged in the 1960s. Correct. Um, has there always been pop art, or was there <laughs> pop art before the 1960s? I would say, yeah, I think there is. Um, there's a painter named Stuart Davis, who's a very well-known painter. There's some of his paintings in the MFA in Boston. He's an internationally uh, known painter. He was active in the 1920s through the early 50s, mid-50s. And to me, he is the beginning of pop art. Hmm. If you look at his work, it is absolutely pop art. Stuart and Davis. Stuart Davis. And the last group of paintings that Andy Warhol was working on before he died were very reminiscent of the work that Stuart Davis was doing in the 1920s. Hmm. So when people say pop art started in the 60s, it's like, no, I think it started, it got a name in the 60s, and yeah. there was a group of people doing it, so it kind of became a focal point. But yeah. I think it had actually been around for a while. It just hadn't kind of gelled itself into a, a movement, particularly. Sure. And pop art, why, why is pop art so popular? Because it's easy to understand. Um, there is no hidden agenda to it. There's no narrative to it. It's it, pretty much what you see is what you get. It's usually lively and fun and colorful and kind of shines the light on everyday things that people recognize and either kind of get the joke, you know, or they just like it because <laughs> it's decorative. You know, and um, so I think it's become popular because it's really kind of, uh, there's no hidden agenda with pop art. It's easy to it, digest. It does, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. You know? yeah. People always say, I wonder what he meant by doing that painting. I was like, what did he mean by painting the soup can? Well, but, the, but ironically, the interesting thing about all that kind of thing with pop art is that it does stop and make you think. Yeah. You know, the, and especially the soup cans. Andy Warhol's art makes you stop and think. It's like, what, what, is, what am I looking at? What is this? You know? yeah. And that's the, kind of the ironic thing about pop art. It was done sort of as a flat, just no no hidden agenda, and yet it does make you stop and think. Absolutely. Um, well, you have a show coming up, an opening, <clears throat> at Mass Bay Community College in Wellesley on September 28th, and the show features uh, many of your album cover paintings. Uh, when did you begin painting album covers, and what inspired you to do so? I started painting them in 2004, so it's been about a decade I've been doing these things. Um, I was working on a kind of a different style of painting um, and I was kind of doing a lot of darks and lights and I had turned the lights off to take off in the studio and I looked over and I saw there was an album cover by uh, Terence Trent Darby mm. and it had his face on the cover. He's a very striking looking young guy and it was a very kind of high contrast photograph and it just caught my eye. I was like, wow, look at that. That would, It looked like a painting and yeah. I knew it was a photograph. Yeah. I said, wait, I gotta do this quick. So I put the I took the album cover and I put it up in my mural and I put a piece of paper next to it. And I very quickly roughed out a painting of the album cover. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting. Has anybody ever done paintings of album covers? You know, because like every artist, I'm always looking for subject matter to paint. And I thought, I don't think anybody's ever done this before. Right. I may be on to something here. Yeah. And uh, that was the beginning of it. And I just started like crazy painting them. Did, did you ever imagine that you would paint more than 350 of them when you started out? No, I thought I'd maybe do five or six of them. Um, no, I, and it just kind of snowballed. I, I didn't show them to anybody for about six months. And then I had a show up in New Hampshire at a gallery in Rochester, New Hampshire. And the response was immediate and kind of overwhelming. People just loved them. Yeah. You know, and I was like, and I've never had that kind of response, that kind of you know, universal response to anything I've ever done. And I think, aha, I'm onto something here. I've always felt that album covers were sort of an underappreciated art form. <clears throat> as a child, as a kid, as a teenager, I would go to the 
record store and just peruse oh, albums. Me too, and me too. Sometimes I would buy records simply by the artwork on the cover. Same here. I owned uh, over 2,000 vinyl record albums. And I, <laughs> I don't even know how many owned? of them I bought. Yeah, I owned. Uh, there, in my, I had a collection of over 2,000. So this is past tense? You've past tense, yeah. I, I sold them all off. Oh. Um, but I bought many of them. I don't even know how many, just because I like the covers. Sure. And I ended up finding some great bands, especially in the 60s and the 70s, there were a lot of great covers done. Yeah. And then I was going through them one day and I realized, I don't know, when was the last time I played the uh, Sop with Camel album from 1967 <laughs> that I bought for the Victor Moscoso cover? But I would pull out the covers and just look at them because I just loved them. Yeah. I love, I lo and it was always, that was like the best job an, an artist could have in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s was he got to do album covers. And that was the job every designer wanted, and like six people got to do them. Yeah, right, and very some of them were, were quite well known and famous. Uh, Andy oh. Warhol made uh, album covers, Robert Rauschenberg. Yep, Peter Max. Were there others, uh, were there some that were your favorites that you particularly were drawn to? Well, it, I was more drawn to the designers who would call Andy Warhol. There were a group of designers who worked for CBS Records and a couple independent studios, Pacific Gas and Light uh, out in the West Coast. and. Uh, Mick Haggerty was another one, but there were a group of, of d album cover designers who specialized in just doing album covers, and they always came up with the best stuff. So they would come out with this crazy, outrageous stuff, and I just loved it. And uh, at what point did album covers stop being simply a photograph of the artist? When did this element of design and creativity start? Well, I, for me, the the, the lightning rod. Ground zero for that was the the Rubber Soul album cover that the Beatles did. Right. The story is that Robert Friedman, who was their favorite photographer, had taken some pictures of the group, and they had gotten together, and he was going to show them some slides. And they were in a little room, and they had a little cardboard set up. And while he was showing it, the cardboard fell backwards, and it distorted the picture. Really? And he was going to go fix it, and Paul McCartney said, Wait, that looks great. That's cool. Let's do that. And that was really the first time... Rubber that soul. an album cover was something other than just a straight-on photograph of the group. Yeah. Because up until then, the record companies just figured out it's for the kids. They'll buy anything. Just slap a picture <laughs> on it, and, and that was it. But that was really the first different album cover, that, and people started thinking about doing something different with the album covers. Will the kids buy anything? I mean, imagery in the form of packaging affects buyer behavior. Can it also affect it negatively? Can it turn people away from buying a particular album? It, well, it does with me. Um, yeah, it, it, it does. Uh, yes, it does. It, it, some, peop some people will just look at an album and go, this is the worst cover ever. Sometimes they don't care because they just want the album. It's less a factor nowadays because music isn't as much of a physical commodity as it used to be. But yeah, I think I just, I just discovered an album from the early 90s that Crosby, Stills & Nash did that I had avoided for 25 years because the cover was just horrible. May I quote you oh, uh, please, uh, <laughs> on how you reacted to that, to that cover? Quote, one of the most stupid, awful, repulsive album covers of all time. It is. It is. It, and it's a great album. And I was it, surprised and embarrassed in the, that I, I had not listened to the album just because I hated the cover so much I wouldn't buy it. Well, that just speaks to the power of design uh, oh, absolutely. in a positive as well as a negative absolutely. way. But um, since album, album cover art is at least partly created to affect consumer behavior, mm -hmm. created to make people buy records. Has it been overlooked as an art form by the wider world of artists and art critics? I think so. I think um, it's starting to now because vinyl's made a comeback. Which yeah, <laughs> nobody I've heard saw about that. that nobody saw that coming. <laughs> um, vinyl albums are starting to sell again. So people are once again looking at an album cover and like, actually taking time to look at it. You know, I have a number of, of uh, kids in their 20s I know who are, are friends of friends or whatever and they actually talk about album covers to me they'll ask me questions about album covers and nobody's mentioned album covers in years because since they became compact discs and then mp3 file the idea of an album cover has become much less important but the uh, there is a, a number of people now who are looking at album covers there are no, a lot of books out about album covers and there are several um, places that have been trying to build a museum with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to do album covers. Because the album covers, people are now realizing that it is kind of a, a past era of art, but that this, there was some great stuff done in this. We, we didn't treat this right. Well, if it is a past era of art and 12-inch uh, vinyl moved to CDs and then intangible digital music, right. 
Are there opportunities for artistic expression related to music? Uh, yes, you've mentioned the slight recovery of uh, interest in, in vinyl, but mm -hmm. where, where are the opportunities for artists to express themselves with uh, music packaging? Well, the bands, um, all bands still need some kind of an image to uh, put in front of the public. You know, um, so they, even though the album cover is no longer uh, as important as it used to be, they still have, there's promotional graphics, there's posters, there's, uh, they're called gig posters. Yeah. A lot of artists do gig posters now for bands, for concerts, you know, like one -off, a one-off poster for a particular concert. Those are incredibly popular. People collect those as a bunch of websites that sell them and collect. So those have become a huge opportunity for artists. A lot of, and a lot of young artists are making those kind of posters and those kind of promotional items. There are two events every year called Flat Stock. Huh. There's one in San Francisco, I believe the other one's in Texas, where artists who make posters show up and it's like a whole weekend of selling art about bands and music art posters and all kinds of stuff that these artists have created. And it's, uh, some of the like original San Francisco guys from the 60s, including yeah. Victor Moscoso, sure. who's the grandfather of all this stuff, uh, he goes there every year now with the son and they have limited edition posters that he did, that he have, signs and numbers. Yeah. And have so you attended Flax? I did, I was, flat I was the flat, flat stock, and it was overwhelming. It, I stopped collecting posters a while ago because I kind of ran out of room, but I stopped, I think I have like six or 700 posters in, in my collection. I was like, I can't buy anymore, but it was just, <laughs> it was killing me not to buy these things because they're beautiful, they're just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have to ask you, did you ever expect to receive the international recognition that, that you have? No, the only inkling I got was when my book, my first book came out, that became a kind of an international uh, peculiar bestseller. Yes. I, was, I started getting letters from all over the world. Jazz Fish Zen. Jazz Fish Zen, yes, and uh, Charles Tuttle Publishing. And uh, I started getting letters from all over the world from people who were like, how are they getting my book in Thailand? And I would get pictures of uh, people getting tattoos of my characters and stuff. And I was like, okay, this is weird. And then once the, once the, the web hit and a lot of promotional stuff is now done on the web, I just, now it's just endless. I sell paintings to people all, all over the world. So I've come to sort of take it for granted now. Yeah. Um, do you have advice for any young artists out there who might be watching us today? about how to get started, how to really be able to earn a living as an artist? Yeah, the opportunity to use the, and I just talked to some people about this who are just starting Mass College of Art and freshmen. They, there is an incredible opportunity to use the World Wide Web to promote yourself and your art. I didn't have that when I was in my mm -hmm. 20s, and if I'd had, it would have made a world of difference. You can uh, promote your work, you can sell your work, you can create an audience and build a fan base all using the web and the internet. Do it, it's great. You'll get, start getting feedback immediately. Yeah. Well, uh, I for one am looking forward to your show. You're Thank opening you. on September 28th at Mass Bay Community College in Wellesley, 12 noon to 3 p.m. Uh, your book of album covers will be available at the opening as well as signed limited edition posters. And I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thank you. My okay. pleasure.